You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mock, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit hankgarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm super excited to have Alice Henderson on the phone with me today. Uh, We're talking about her brand new book, A Solitude of Wolverines. And I have to tell you, this is this is one of the most unique uh, premises and uh, one of the most unique books that comes from that that I've read in quite a while. And we were just laughing um, because I actually have a finished hardcover um, copy of the book and and Alice doesn't have one at all, which I find <laughs> um, heartbreaking and hilarious at the same time, if that can if that can happen. Uh, but welcome to the show, Alice. Thank you so much for having me, Hank. I'm really excited to be here. I'm excited to have you. Um, Alice, we begin each show with the same question. And that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Well, I have a very vivid memory of this. Um, My father was a gifted poet and short story writer. And he used to write on this old manual Underwood typewriter. And when he upgraded, he gave me this old typewriter. I was about six. (laughs) And I'd already been tinkering around with hand-drawn stories, mainly about monsters and ghosts. But when I got this glorious old typewriter, I thought, this is the kind of typewriter that detective fiction should be written on. Right. I mean, I was so little, my fingers would get stuck between the keys and it was hard to type on. But um, at the time, my main exposure to the mystery genre was hard-boiled detective stories and old-time radio shows uh, with those, you know, tough guy characters and (laughs) Seamuses. And because all of those characters were so cool and competent and had smooth names like Sam Spade or Richard Diamond, my six-year-old self thought it would be hilarious if my detective had a really awkward name (laughs) and was really bad at solving crimes. So I named him Maynard A. Flitschenheimer III, (laughs) (laughs) P.I. He seldom caught the right perp. And you know how in those books, the detectives use a lot of those hard-boiled similes? Right. Um, well, for some reason, as a six-year-old, I thought it would be so funny <laughs> if Flitch and Heimer's similes didn't make any sense at all. So <laughs> instead of saying something like, uh, he had the kind of shrewd eyes that made you think of a seagull eyeing your lunch, <laughs> Flitch and Heimer would say something like, he had the kind of shrewd eyes that made you think of a clown riding a tricycle on a broken down pier waiting for pea soup or a rummage sale, whichever came first. <laughs> oh, that's so anyway, amazing. Over, <laughs> I just had so much fun writing him and and over the years I kept adding cases to his case log and I still write about Flitchenheimer to this day still on that same old manual typewriter. I I want to read the Flitchenheimer series right now. Take my money. <laughs> uh that the fact that you had the wherewithal to deconstruct those similes at six years old to to know that it was a trope and to to deconstruct them to do them wrongly is amazing to me (laughs) thank you i i just love those and i don't know if this is a good or bad sign but i would just laugh hysterically while writing these stories and i still do it's he's so freeing because when i plot i'm like a laborious plotter and with flitchenheimer i don't know what the story is going to be about i just start typing. He's in his office. A client walks in and I'm off to the races. So it's just so fun to just see what happens. That is amazing. You know, I I wrote a novel uh, a couple of years ago called Writer's Block, and it was um, the the gist is that that there's a a famous novelist and he's uh, due to deliver his third book in in a trilogy and he's completely stuck. And he has an old IBM Selectric, uh, so it's not you know as as uh, wonderful as an as old manual Underwood. Um, but the thing is, he goes to that typewriter to to type things 
at just random to see if it will unstick his writer's block and then hilarity ensues. Um, so I love that idea that, you know, sometimes there's magic in these old machines and um, the fact that you go to that old Underwood and it, are just completely, uh, you know, in, in the face of your normal writing patterns, uh, that there's something that there, I don't know if it's something tactile about these old machines, but the, there's something magical about writing on those. And, and whether we publish it for the rest of the world or not, that there is something special about those, uh, old machines and, and writing on those. I absolutely agree. And that's so cool that you used an IBM Selectric. I can still remember the hum when you turn it on. Yes. And it feels like that you're humming, your brain's going, your that story's imminent. <laughs> well, I'm I'm old enough to have taken typing class in high school. And I remember we had a room full of those IBM Selectrics and and you would turn it on, and you would place your fingers on the home row keys and just that that feeling of vibration that went into your fingers and uh, you know, emanated up your arms and into your torso was uh, it was magic. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. That was incidentally what my father upgraded to when he gave me his manual one was That's his fantastic. big old humming, wonderful electric typewriter. Well, as someone who uh, who had such an affinity for writing at a at an early age uh, and, you know, comes from great writer stock like you do with your father being the poet and short story writer that he is, um, you went on to uh, pursue a career in wildlife studies. Uh, is that right? I actually, it sort of did things backwards. I mean, most people would have, you know, the more, I'll say, normal job that supports their writing. I did it the other way around. I <laughs> started writing for a living. And because I could write from anywhere, it allowed me to be able to go out to really remote places for long stretches of time to take on these wildlife projects. Um, a lot of which I actually do pro bono if it's for a nonprofit that needs help. So um, yeah, I actually support my wildlife work through my writing. That's, that's amazing. Um, what, what was it that uh, intrigued you about um, the wildlife studies and, and getting to know the, the natural world if it, as it were? Well, I, I've been fascinated with wildlife for as long as I can remember, and I've always been split down the middle between the sciences and the arts, and it's always been a struggle um, to choose which path to follow. So I've ended up following both, um, even though I did end up uh, writing is a little more lucrative <laughs> than being <laughs> in the middle of nowhere tracking caribou. But um, even as a kid, I, I was so upset when I learned what extinction was. And I remember asking my parents, like, what do they mean this species has gone forever? Like, I didn't understand. And we did it to this species, you know. And, and so, again, when I was six, that same year I started writing the Flitchenheimer stories, I formed my own little organization. And I roped my friends into doing chores and tasks and selling crafts and things like that. So I could pool money together to donate to places like Greenpeace. I would ride my bike down to the local wildlife sanctuary and muck out raccoon cages and things like that. And then as I got older, um, when I went to college, my degrees are all kind of split down the middle. Like my bachelor's is part in writing, part in zoology and biogeography. And I just, care so deeply about what's happening with wildlife and this extinction event we're in the middle of that I just felt compelled to to help with it. Gotcha. Um, I love when when someone's um, love and their passions bleed over into the types of stories that they write. And that, that's one thing that I love about your new book is that you uh, – kind of take the things that you've learned from working with wildlife and in uh, conservation and and the study of that. And, and it informs the the type of story that you've written. Um, did you ever conceive that these two passions would merge one day? I didn't until just recently when I wrote The Sol a Solitude of Wolverines. My previous fiction had all been in like the horror and science fiction genres and writing, doing comics work and things like that. While at the same time, I was out in the field doing wildlife research. And then 
a couple of years ago, I was in Montana on a wildlife sanctuary and they were interested to know if wolves had returned to the area and wolverines, actually. I set out some remote cameras for wolverines as well. But I was setting up, I do bioacoustic work. So I set up these recorders in the field and they record both audible sounds and ultrasonic sounds of bats. So then I can take the recordings later and determine what species are present. It's a great non-invasive way to to study species because you're not having to trank them and tag them or misnet bats, which bats are crabby little guys and they hate that, understandably. <laughs> but I was setting up my recording equipment and I thought, why don't I combine my love of writing with this wildlife work? And it was a very remote area in Montana, which was a great setting for a thriller. I love reading thrillers and it just all came together suddenly. And I came up with this character of Alex Carter, the wildlife biologist protagonist in A Solitude of Wolverines, and was able to channel all of my passion for helping wildlife and my field experience, along with my love of suspense, into this book. You've done a lot of work in uh, media tie-ins and uh, written uh, novels and, and comics uh, for for a number of, uh, you know, big series. Uh, how did you get started doing that? I'm, I'm always fascinated, um, you know, when I look through someone's back catalog and there are just all of these um, entries and, and how do you break into work like that? You know, it's, it's kind of sad that so much of the time it's who you know and the connections you make and if I had known that as a writer earlier on, I would have gone to conferences a lot sooner when I was trying to get published. So I had been trying to get my, as they say, original fiction published, my non-media tie-in fiction published to no avail. And I was at a World Horror Con, and I met one of the writers who was writing for Buffy, the Vampire Slayer, Ivan Navarro. And we talked, and she was so kind and so encouraging. And she gave me the name of her editor and I wrote the editor and I pitched a few ideas for Buffy and they bought one of them. So I was just thrilled. That was the first novel I ever had published was a Buffy the Vampire Slayer novel. And then I had also just prior to that um, been working at, for George Lucas in the Bay Area. So I had some Star Wars writing credits. And then once I had that Buffy the Vampire Slayer and Star Wars credits, work started to come a little easier. And I so I pitched another Buffy book and they bought that. And then unfortunately, they stopped publishing those. But I went on to write for the TV show Supernatural, I, a, a novel tie-in for that. They're so much fun to write, actually, because... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm actually... I'm actually Facebook friends with Yvonne uh, Navarro that you mentioned. And um, oh, when cool. she, she and her husband, Weston, are such fabulous people. I um, love them. I know they're, they're great. Um, but it's, uh, it, that's a funny thing. You know, once it, it's kind of one of these things that once you get your foot in the door, kind of work begets work at, at some point, doesn't it? It does. And with those tie-in novels, the deadlines are ridiculously short. I think I had three months to write both Buffy's and maybe even less than that for the Supernatural novel. So once you show editors that you can produce on a really tight deadline and produce something they like, then they're more likely to use you again. So um, well, that brings up a great point because, you know, with the, with the way that traditional publishing um, is, uh, a lot of times people fall into kind of a one book a year schedule and you know the 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 thought around that is that it takes a year to construct a novel because that's that's usually the way most publishing schedules go well when you get into doing work like this um you realize that that you can actually um generate work a lot faster than that if you if you put your mind to it um how do you feel like doing work like that as opposed to the standalone novels that you're doing now um, do you find those two things to be congruous that um, uh, that doing the media tie ins is do you see the similarities between the creative process between those and your standalone work? I do. When I first was writing novels, um, 
I would take usually about a year, nine months to a year to write one. So when I got that Buffy deadline for three months, I thought, oh, oh boy, <laughs> I was pretty nervous about pulling it off. And I just became very regimented in my schedule. But what I learned was, I think a lot of people have this idea that if you write something under a short deadline, it's not going to be as good or you're rushed through it. But I actually found writing that book that when you're working so hard every day and you're living and breathing with these characters and the plot's always with you, I actually find my work turns out better, or at least I'm happier with it when it's tighter, a tighter deadline like that. And it also showed me that I can do it. You know, I can do these, I can crank out these novels under a tight deadline and and be proud of what I've turned out. So even though now I have longer to write the books, I'm still tending to stick to that, not quite that hectic uh, three month, but usually somewhere between five and seven months is how long it's taking me now to write an original book. A lot of the solitude of Wolverines is so research intensive. And right. the the cli-fi, have you heard of that term? It's yeah. Okay. Um, the cli-fi trilogy I wrote before that also so research intensive that I really needed those extra months just to nail that down. Whereas with the tie-in, the world's already established. You're not really having to research how the mechanics of your world and how the characters interact. So those are a little faster to write. Sure. So so tell me about the new book, A Solitude of Wolverines. Um, you've got this fantastic character, Alex Carter, um, that you told me a few minutes ago really – um, kind of instigated this series that you you created her and just loved her. Um, what came first? What was it, Alex, uh, or was it the the idea the the plot for this book? Did 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 Alex come first, and then the stories around Alex, or was there a story and Alex walked on the stage? Normally, I come up with the plot first, and then I figure out what kind of character would be most challenged by that plot. But in the case of Alex, they arrived simultaneously. I had been on this many months long trip across the U.S., going from wildlife preserve to wildlife preserve, doing these species presence surveys and studies. And, and just the people I encountered and these remote places and the work. And then my own experiences and how I, people reacted to my work and how I was received in different areas. It all sort of fell together, like this could be really wrought with suspense, these remote areas and and having someone who was passionate about wildlife and wanting to help preserve endangered species. It all just fell together at the same time, which was a good feeling. So um, tell us tell us a little bit about um, Alex Carter. What what is it about her that that uh, grabbed your attention? I like that she's unapologetically dedicated to her goal in life to help endangered species. She's pretty fearless in it. And being out in these remote areas for long stretches of time means it's tough for her to maintain relationships, for example, but she doesn't let that stop her from her singular focus of helping wildlife. I like that she's really resourceful. I wanted to create a, a female protagonist that was very resourceful and could fight and think her way out of dangerous situations. Um, sort of a MacGyver-esque character, I guess, that was prepared to, you know, she could fix cars and <laughs> she can fight uh, martial arts. And I like how brave she is and I like how passionate she is about helping wildlife. The Novel Factory Online is software for the serious writer. With features like notes that are automatically organized, that means no more drowning in piles of paper, notes, or spending hours organizing digital folder structures. The Novel Factory offers clear, obvious structures for noting down information about plot, characters, locations, and everything else relating to your novel. Innovative features like the roadmap take you from concept to finished novel. The Roadmap is an optional step-by-step -step guide to writing a novel that takes you from the premise to final manuscript and beyond. 
It draws on tried and true, tested theory that lies behind the majority of best-selling novels and blockbuster movies. Access your writing anywhere. The web version of the Novel Factory can be accessed anywhere you have internet. So you can write your novel on the train to work, while walking the dog, or climbing a mountain. Just log in and all your drafts and notes will be at your fingertips. Go to novel-writer.com to see how this powerful software can unleash your creative side. Use code HANK2020 for 20% off. That's the Novel Factory. Authors, I have a fantastic new service to tell you about. It's called PubSite. PubSite is a service to help you build your very own website, your home on the web, where you can promote your work and give your fans a place to connect with you. PubSite is a website platform that allows every author, regardless of budget, to have a great-looking professional website developed by the book marketing professionals at FSB Associates. PubSite is the new easy-to-use DIY website builder developed specifically for books and authors. Whether you're an author of one book or 20 or a small publisher, PubSite allows you to build, design, and most importantly, update your website pain-free. No need to be dependent on a designer or webmaster to make a small but costly change to your website. Save the money and do it yourself. PubSite is the best platform for authors because it's a book-centric platform. PubSite was built just for authors and small publishers. Every design, feature, and layout is book-centric. They have customized designs for you to use. It's easy to build. No coding or HTML is necessary to create a stunning, professional-looking website with all the features you want. Get a custom domain name, yourname.com. It's simple to update. You can add all of your books, add a blog and a book tour, sell from any retailer, manage your email list and social media, and even do e-commerce. Build your website with a 14-day free trial, then pay just $19.99 per month, which includes hosting. And we offer packages starting at $499 to set up the website for you. Pub-Site.com, the place to help authors find their home on the web. You mentioned earlier um, things like um, bioacoustic studies um, where you were studying the bats and and things like that. And, um, you know, those are uh, things that you just don't hear brought up in polite conversation um, <laughs> very, very often. <laughs> um, but do, do things like that thing, tools that you've used in your other work and by other, I'm getting air quotes over here, your other work, um, do do things like that 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 are are not um, thought about typically? Do those come up in in your fiction writing? And do you find interesting ways to bring these these cool tools into the story? That's, that's a good question, and it's tough to like know what the reader will find interesting and how much detail they might want. And you know, sometimes when I when I'm talking about bioacoustics, just with my friends and. I get met with these blank stares and, um, <laughs> you know, and then I don't want to be, well, bioacoustics is the study of, and launch into some kind of weird lecture mode. So it's tough to like work in these interesting ways to study wildlife and the technical aspects. I mean, one challenge with a solitude of wolverines is she builds these so-called camera traps where it's not a traditional trap where you're actually trapping the animal, but you're trapping them on a camera. So there is this very specific way that Wolverine researchers build these successful um, camera traps. So I wanted to explain that in the book, but I don't know if I went into too much detail um, explaining the <laughs> minutia of how these traps are constructed. And they not only take a picture of the animal, but they um, collect the hairs of the animal as well for DNA later. So it is it is a challenge to work in the, the specifics of these research methods. You, uh, you mentioned earlier the, um, the amount of research that goes into uh, you know, one of these stories, and especially in a standalone novel where you don't have the benefit of the world building that goes into some of the tie-in novels that you talk about. But you know, there's an interesting place that a writer finds him or herself in uh, when you're talking about topics that the reader's not necessarily going to be informed on, 
And you have to decide how much information am I going to give the reader? How much will they find interesting? How much of the plot depends on these details? And how much of it do I just need to know as the writer so that I can form the the plot and characters around it, but not necessarily tell the readers? Um, how do you weigh those things? Because, uh, you know, it, as writing a book that that takes the kind of research that you're talking about, um, it brings up some tricky situations like that. How do you decide? It is tricky. Um, when I wrote A Solitude of Wolverines, actually, the original version was pretty technical. And then I had an editor read it who wanted me to take out all of the technical stuff. And my agent and I didn't end up going with her. We went with uh, Lisa at HarperCollins and she loved that. She wanted more about wildlife and more about the biology. So that was more in tune with what I had originally wanted for the book as well. So it, some of it is so subjective. You have to picture how much is your typical reader going to want to know? Some will want to know more, some will want to know less. So will the people that want to know less just sort of skim through and get to the action again? Or will they be, will the people that want to know more be disappointed if you put in less? So it's, I usually err on trying to be right around the middle, like not getting super technical or bogged down. Um, and I usually look at the length of the passage. And if I've gone on for more than a page about some technical specifics, then I'll try to cut that down a little bit. So what did you decide for um, the plot for the story? What happens in the book? We, we've established that that Alex is a fantastic character and that she's going to helm um, many mysteries to come, I'm sure. Um, but uh, what happens uh, with her in this book? You mean plot wise? Yeah. So she gets a job um, studying wolverines on a wildlife sanctuary in remote northwestern Montana. And it's this huge tract of land that used to have wolverines, but a ski resort was built there in the 1930s and all the wolverines have vanished from the area. So now the resort is shut down and a land trust has acquired this land and put a conservation easement on it so it's protected. And they hire Alex to find out if wolverines have returned to the area. So while she's out in the field, she sets up remote cameras to see if she can capture images of these elusive creatures. But when she reviews the footage, she's startled to see images of the severely injured man wandering on the preserve. And when she sets out to help him, she realizes too late that she's stumbled on a secret that someone will kill to protect. And so that's the plot of this. And I, I thought, you know, each book would be about a different species. And I wanted to name each book the group name of the animal and the animal, you know, like a den of wolves, a, a pot of whales, a parliament of owls. But when I started writing about wolverines, they're so solitary that I realized there is no group name for wolverines. So I had to make up my own group name. And since they are so solitary, I decided upon a solitude of wolverines. And I, is... I really wanted to talk about wolverines because not a lot of people know much about them. And right. they're really in trouble. And there's less than 300 in the contiguous U.S. And U.S. Fish and Wildlife just decided again um, this August to not extend protections to them. So I really wanted to bring some shed some light on their plight. Wow. Um, at what point did you know um, that that this had series potential? When did you know that Alex was a character who who the readers would want to see more from? I, I hope that from the beginning, actually, because I I really, really wanted to bring all the tools in my wheelhouse to helping wildlife. And I thought, you know, if I write a nonfiction book, for example, about wolverines, only a handful of people might read it. And they're probably going to be people who are already on board with helping them. But I thought if I wrote something suspenseful and engaging that readers might read for that reason, 
And then on the side, be like, oh, these animals are interesting. I, I wanted to engage the readers with how fascinating wolverines are and what a loss they would be if if they didn't make it. And so I really hope in the beginning that it that it would catch on as a series so that I could bring attention to different species as the series progressed. Well, I can't wait to see where you take this series. Um, a Solitude of Wolverines, Alex Carter series book one is absolutely fantastic. This is a must have uh, for your bedside table or your uh, to be read pile for the fall. You won't want to miss this book. Um, I- I'm going to put links to it in the show notes of this episode. Alice, if people are just discovering you and want to dig into all the great stuff that you do, where can they find you online? You can go to alicehenderson.com and that has all my books and my newsletter, which not only has publishing news, but has stuff like green tips and wildlife in the news and species spotlights on different endangered species and even volunteer opportunities if you want to get out in the field and help. Absolutely. We'll put links to that as well so that people can easily find you and all the great stuff that you're involved with and uh, find ways to get involved themselves. Uh, Alice, this has been so much fun talking. Um, I love A Solitude of Wolverines, and we're going to send everyone to see you. Thank you so much, Hank. I really appreciate it. Do you want to get paid to write stories? Do you enjoy collaborating with other talented storytellers? Do you want to work completely remotely and set your own hours? Relay Publishing is looking for writers and editors to work on fiction projects across a range of genres, from thrillers to sci-fi, fantasy, and romance. The Relay process is extremely collaborative, in the same vein as a TV show's writer's room. If you're a story geek, then you'll be on a great team. There are seven ghost writing positions and ten editing positions currently available please go to www.recruitment.relaypub.com. That's www.recruitment.relaypub.com for more information on how to apply. Join a great storytelling team today. What Death Taught Terrence by Derek McFadden. Life is a journey. So is the afterlife. At the end of his life, Terrence McDonald must discover its meaning or he'll be banned from the afterlife forever and his soul will cease to exist. Join Terrence and those who love him on a poignant and unforgettable journey through a life at once wonderful and harrowing. Learn what Terrence learned. See what Terrence sees. By this provocative story's end, readers may even learn a thing or two about themselves. See why people are saying things like, Derek McFadden writes with an insight you can match. If you like the works of Mitch Album, I think you'll find What Death Taught Terrence a worthy addition to your library and the reading of it, a life-affirming journey. I found the story immediately immersive and it stuck with me long after I finished. What Death Taught Terrence by Derek McFadden on sale now. Invasion Day, the first book in the They Came for Blood series by Scott Moon. David Osage is a dangerous man with a complicated past, but these days he's just trying to keep his head down, driving big rigs. One night he saddles himself with a hitchhiker, a nuisance who's more than she seemed, and that's when everything changes. No one was ready for an alien invasion. Death is raining from the sky and the only questions left is do you run, fight, or submit? For David Osage and his family, answering is as easy as giving the alien invaders the finger. Grab book one, Invasion Day, in the They Came for Blood series, and then follow it up with book two, Resistance Day, and book three, Victory Day. Available at Amazon.com.